So of the three main causes of hemolytic anemia that we're going to focus on in the class, immune-mediated is the last one we're going to talk about, and it is relatively more common than the others. And so this immune-mediated uh, etiology is due to antibodies that are directed at red blood cells. And these antibodies can be autoantibodies, meaning that the body itself has started making antibodies against red blood cells, and this can be due to primary reasons, and these are usually idiopathic, and I would say this is most common that we see in dogs. Uh, or it can be secondary autoantibody. So this could be things, we sometimes see this with certain drugs, um, especially penicillin in horses and other drugs. Or you can have alloantibodies, and alloantibodies are ones that we see potentially secondary to an incompatible transfusion, or even neonatal isoerythrolysis are the two most common. So the next part we're going to talk about how you actually identify immune-mediated anemia and why the anemia forms along with the um, autoantibody or alloantibody being produced. So I'm not going to really differentiate auto from alloantibody from this point on, but most of the time it's going to be autoantibody. So the anemia forms due to, so here's an antibody attached to the red cell, and again, it could be an auto or allo antibody. And then within the spleen, usually, so within the spleen and potentially liver and other organs, there are, of course, macrophages, which we talked about earlier. And these actually phagocytize the red blood cells. So here's the red cell, and here's our antibody attached. And so there's, you can have kind of option one, not even option one, but mechanism one, is complete phagocytosis of the red blood cells. And when this happens, of course, you go down that path of heme being broken down into bilirubin um, from um, the heme protein. And that's how, of course, you see the hyperbilirubinemia. And this complete phagocytosis is really extravascular hemolysis. And again, it can happen in the spleen, liver, et cetera, resulting in hyperbilirubinemia and bilirubinuria when it's high enough. And the next we're going to talk about is one of the things that you actually see on a blood smear, and this is a result of partial phagocytosis. And when you see partial phagocytosis, well, it's not that you see it so much as you see something on the blood smear that tells you um, that the red cells are being partially phagocytized by um, macrophages within the spleen and other organs. So in partial phagocytosis, the red cell antibody, the FC portion of the antibody, is targeted by the macrophage. And so if the antibody then bound, and of course the macrophage identifies that, and it removes that portion of the red cell which actually has the antibody bound to it. So what you wind up with is a red cell minus a little bit of the membrane, and that makes the red cell unstable, and so it actually spheres. And when the red blood cell spheres, we call that a spherocyte. And so it goes from being a biconcave disc to a sphere, um, hence the name spherocyte. And that tells us that there's an immune-mediated process going on. And we'll talk in a second about the additional diagnostics that you can do. So within the blood, there can be few to many spherocytes or rare spherocytes. And we start thinking really IMHA or immune-mediated hemolytic anemia when we get into the moderate to many spherocytes. So you expect to see a lot of them. Only seeing a few, you may question whether or not it's going on. So this is another mechanism that tells you extravascular hemolysis is occurring. Those are the two kind of most common things, as you'll see, of course, anemia, and then you'll see spherocytes. The third thing, and the other sort of option that can happen, is you can have intravascular hemolysis. And intravascular hemolysis occurs due to often IgM, so you can have those you know, much larger antibodies. I can't really draw an IgM. Let's pretend I can, that pentamere, which is more likely to form a, that membrane attack complex, although there are other mechanisms. And of course, if you remember from membrane from immunology, membrane attack complex results in hemolysis within um, right then and there, so within the vasculature. So we actually see intravascular hemolysis of the red cells um, within vessels. So of course, when you see intravascular hemolysis, you're going to see hemoglobinemia, hemoglobinuria. Um, and anemia as well. Now this can happen with 
the extravascular hemolysis. So this is kind of the bonus. It may happen, it may not happen, but you identify IMHA by spherocytes, um, and the anemia usually occurs extravascularly, but it may also occur intravascularly. So this may or may not happen. It's a plus or minus. It can mean the animal has more severe hemolysis occurring. But again, intravascular hemolysis, hemoglobinemia, hemoglobinuria are not specific to IMHA. We saw it with um, both infectious and with Heinz bodies as well. And remember, you could also see ghost cells along with the hemoglobinemia and hemoglobinuria to tell you that you have intravascular hemolysis. So another finding that you may see with immune-mediated immune anemia, which isn't always the case, is you may see autoagglutination. And this is more often something that you see when you have those large pentamers from IgM, although you can see it with others. And within the blood tube and on the smear, you'll see red blood cells sticking together. So this is called autoagglutination. And there are other things that can make red blood cells stick together. Uh, but when they're in this big grape cluster, that you know is autoagglutination. The other thing when we talk about fibrinogen, we'll talk about something called rouleau. And this is when red cells actually stack together like a um, kind of a group of coins. And that's actually due to increases in proteins and red cell stickiness. So this is not anything to do with immune-mediated anemia. The test that we use to diagnose immune-mediated anemia um, if you have spherocytes, it's certainly very supportive, but the test you can do is a direct antiglobulin test, and this is also called a Coombs test. And this test actually identifies, let's draw some red cells, it actually identifies the antibody on the red blood cells, and it does so by using a secondary antibody to cause essentially an endpoint of autoagglutination. So you incubate the blood with this sort of anti-dog antibody, and that results in agglutination. And so, of course, if you already have autoagglutination, you can't run this test because that's the endpoint of it. It's similar to blood typing that also uses agglutination. The Coombs test or direct antiglobulin test isn't always done, um, but it can be done, especially if you don't have a lot of spherocytes, but you want to confirm the diagnosis. So just as a review, diagnosis of hemolytic anemia, at least the three main causes we talked about. For infectious, you actually want to see the organism. So you need to know which species get which types of red cell organisms. That's the first thing. And then what are other diagnostics? So that's how you would approach it in real life, of course. Uh, oxidative, we look for things again, such as Heinz bodies and eccentrocytes. And both of those are specific for oxidative injury. And you can see both of these in low numbers in some animals where the, it's not a primary cause of the anemia, it's just contributing. And then you can see it in other animals where it is the primary cause. And then immune-mediated, most commonly, we'll see spherocytes. But you may also see autoagglutination, but that's less common because that's usually IgM-mediated and we don't see that as often. And so other things that are not specific we talked about would be just the increases in bilirubin in the blood and in the, um, then the urine. That's not specific to a certain etiology. It's just specific to hemolysis, at least for now. Uh, you can see intravascular hemolysis, which is not specific to any one of these. Um, autoagglutination was the one that was somewhat specific. So going back to that original hemolysis video, uh, those are sort of how you're going to work through these. Other causes of hemolytic anemia, we're not going to go through. Some of them are inherited, um, such as PFK and PK, which you'll most likely learn about in one of the med surge classes. There's not a specific finding on the red cells, but there are specific breeds that are affected. And uh, certain metabolic conditions can cause profound hemolysis as well. And again, we're not going to go through those now. The big one is really low phosphorus or hypophosphatemia.